Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Skylar MacDonald, and I am CAD and Technical Lead at the London Ambulance Service. For the next 30 minutes, the D in CAD means dispatch rather than design. Um, <laughs> that will make the whole talk a lot less confusing for you. Um, essentially, what my job entails is all of the technology and systems in our control room are looked after operationally by me and my team. Hi, Sue and Rob, if you're watching at home. And this is a story about the worst day of your life. Ambulance service, is the patient breathing? Hello, I have an ambulance service. Okay, is the patient breathing? I don't know, Daddy, she's breathing! No, she's not. Okay, what's the address of the emergency? You, Eleanor Shellstrop, are dead. You are in cardiac arrest, your heart has stopped beating, you have stopped breathing, and medically speaking, you have died. Which is not a great start to your afternoon. But worry not, someone has called 999. That's already increased your chance of survival from zero to somewhere slightly above zero. <laughs> but you don't care about all that, you want to become not dead. This is the story about all the technology, systems and processes that are going to help the London Ambulance Service save your life. Now, let's start at the beginning because in the inimitable words of Julie Andrews, it's a very good place to start. You've gone into cardiac arrest and someone has called 999. Someone's identified that you've stopped breathing and medical help has been summoned. But the start of that 999 call was interesting. Put that out of your mind for a moment. If you were designing the platonic ideal 999 call, the call that is perfect for treating spherical patients in a vacuum, what would be the piece of information that you would ask for first? The address, maybe? The nature of the problem? So let's talk about this, because as you now know, you're wrong. As you heard, this is the opening phrase for all 999 calls to the ambulance service. And so, to understand why, let's play the call again, but this time I'm going to dim the clip a bit and I'm going to overlay all of the key things that are happening as the call goes on. Don't worry about understanding all of it right now. Obviously, I'm going to go into that later. Um, but let's have a look. Ambulance service. Is the patient breathing? I have an ambulance Okay. Is the patient breathing? I don't know. Is she breathing? No, she's not. Okay, what's the address of the emergency? It took 11 seconds from the call being answered until an ambulance was dispatched. 11 seconds. That's pretty impressive, to be fair. As for how and why this happens, let's go into the background. Obviously, not every call is someone who has stopped breathing. So, in 2017, NHS England introduced the Ambulance Response Programme, which replaced the previous mishmash of call priorities with five key levels of emergency response. Category one, the highest, is for patients who have the most life-threatening illnesses or injuries, where every second counts. Category two is for other emergency calls, such as heart attacks, strokes, serious bleeding, or other emergencies for patients that really need to get to hospital quickly, but don't need that time-critical response, the same as someone who, for example, as a Cat 1, needs CPR on scene. Category 3 is urgent calls, your broken legs, your fallers without serious injuries, your severe abdominal pain, other urgent issues that need to go to hospital, but can wait if there are higher priority calls and not enough ambulances. Category four calls are less urgent for conditions such as diarrhea and vomiting, you're welcome, or other some types of infection where an ambulance will eventually be sent, but if there's no alternative way of providing the care that patient needs. Category four calls may also receive a telephone assessment from a paramedic or a nurse while waiting for that definitive care. Category five calls sort of don't really exist. Those are calls that we almost definitely won't send an ambulance to at all. These are things like nosebleeds, falls with zero injuries whatsoever, irregular heartbeats without any other symptoms, that sort of thing. Those will receive a telephone assessment as with a CAT4 or the caller will be advised to contact NHS 111 for advice and further signposting. 
Each priority of call has a target time for how long by rolling average it should take for us to get there. Category 1 calls are different in that the clock stops when the first resource arrives on scene, no matter what it is. In the other categories, the clock can only stop when the full ambulance response is sent. Cat 5s don't have a response target because, as I said, we don't go to them, generally. The other thing you should know is that right now, almost every ambulance in almost every ambulance service in the country is probably on a call. There are never enough ambulances. For the approximately 10 million people in London right now, including the 8 million who live there and the 2 million who commute in for work or leisure, there are about 400 ambulances on duty. However, having said that, if an ambulance is still on its way to its allocated incident and a higher priority call comes in, we have the ability to divert them to the higher priority call. In London, this happens all the time. But how do you get your priority? You've heard the nature of call or knock questions being asked in our clip, because what EMF really needed is another acronym that ends in OC. Um, and I'm more than happy to talk you through them in a bit more detail. But to give us a more realistic overview of how things work, please welcome real-life ambulance service call handler Cameron. <laughs> Afternoon. How are you enjoying sunlight? Yeah, it's nice to be out of the bunker for once. <laughs> so, before we get back to this, we will get back to this, but before we get back to this, what's the worst call you've ever taken? That's what you mean, my therapists, Guy. No, that's a good point, because you don't ask us that question. <laughs> that will save some awkwardness later in the bar. Right, back to nature of call and the pre-triage sieve. As you heard on the tape that we played you, the first question is... Emergency ambulance, is the patient breathing? We follow that with... Is the patient awake? And if the patient is not awake, we ask... Is their breathing noisy? Then we ask... Oh, you tell me exactly this. what's happened. Uh, <laughs> I it's normally fine. don't have lights in my face, in my defence. Yeah. Um, and then once we've established basically what's happened, we will ask... What's the address of the emergency? However, once, as you heard in the clip, if we've established something more critical is happening earlier on in the call, we can jump straight from breathing or, or, or noisy breathing to asking for the address. So the question is, why this? Why are we asking if the patient is breathing first before we're asking for the address? The reason is twofold. Reason number one, we already know where you are. Ish. <laughs> so, when your 999 call connects to us, BT passes through some detail called ISEC, the Enhanced Information System for Emergency Calls. This puts you approximately on the map where you are. The pin in the middle is the cell tower through which your phone is making the 999 call. And then the radius is approximately based on the signal how far away you might be. About 20 seconds into the call, that then gets converted to advanced mobile location, or AML, when your phone sends an SMS message. Yes, really, in 2024, an SMS message to BT with your GPS location. It kicks in the GPS on your phone and sends the coordinates through to BT. I am pleased to announce that now in 2024, a decade after AML was introduced, we are finally doing this with HTTP. <laughs> so now we receive an update via HTTP whenever the GPS fix gets better or if the device changes location. The second reason, which, to be fair, you've probably worked out by now that we ask if the patient is breathing, is because we're looking for a Category 1. We need to be able to identify these Category 1 calls as early as possible. So the quicker we know it's a Category 1, the quicker we can send an ambulance, and the quicker you will become less dead. If we identify in the pre-triage sieve that the patient is not breathing or they're unconscious with noisy breathing, which has been shown to indicate that they may suddenly stop breathing very soon, uh, we fire off a predicted Category 1 call. Remember this from the 999 call? This here is where that prediction is made, 10 seconds into the call. We have other options to send out a Category 1 predict based on the information that we're given in response to that question. If what's said in response to the tell me exactly what's happened is meets any of our other knock criteria. Cameron, other examples of Cat 1 knock types? Um, so it says active seizures, stabbings, shootings, drownings, general unconscious following trauma. Welcome to EMF. <laughs> 
So the question is, if we already know where you are, and we've already spotted a cat one, why are we actually bothering with the rest? Why are we asking for the address afterwards? Let's have a look at the question. Have you identified the reason we still ask the question? How about now? There are myriad reasons why the caller and the patient might not be in the same place. Someone might be calling on behalf of a friend or family member who's not with them. Someone might work in another service control room, like police or fire, and need to notify us of an incident that they're attending and need us to help with. Or, for, to be honest, the ISEC hit might just not be good enough. It happens. Mobile signal, as we all know from being here, is not perfect. Now for the first of my interesting tangents. Interesting tangent music, please. Thank you. <laughs> That's actually everything I need from you, so thank you, Cameron. Cameron, everybody. <laughs> what happens if you have no signal? You're at EMF, after all. What happens if you haven't paid your phone bill or you're just out of an area of coverage? Can you call 999? How does it work? You can. You've probably seen the phrase emergency calls only on your phone unless you have an iPhone and this is an argument I am still having with Apple to this day. What that means is your phone can't see your mobile network but it can see others. And because the generosity and public spiritedness of the mobile carriers knows no bounds, they will allow you to use the other networks for the purpose of making emergency calls only. How nice of them to do so. And that's what they do. However, because capitalism gonna capitalism, and to be fair, for a lot of other non-capitalism reasons I entirely do not have time to explain, this is the phone number that appears on our system when you make a call through someone else's network. We don't get any of the information, we don't get the location, it's called a limited service state, and that's all we see. This is why it's extremely important that the call handler also asks for your telephone number on the call so that we can call you back in case we get disconnected or there's more information we need or we can't find you, that sort of thing. So please be nice to your call handlers. But you don't care about any of that. For those of you just joining us, you are dead. And we're trying to prevent that from happening. So far, we know you're not breathing. We've predicted a Category 1 call as a result. We know roughly where you are. And we've asked for your exact location. Next to do, we need to find your precise location and we need to send you the ambulance. And also, what happens while you wait? But hold on, didn't the ambulance get sent in 11 seconds? Why do I have sending the ambulance on my to-do list? Why do I have finding the address on my to-do list? Well, right now, whoever we've sent is navigating to this. <laughs> These are the Ordnance Survey Eastings and Northings of the call that you have made. Uh, in the bar later, we can have an argument about whether Eastings and Northings are better than Latitude and Longitude. Um, but for the call handler, it would be great if we could turn this into something that means anything to the ambulance crew. I'll talk about how they got sent in a bit, but the key fact is, sadly, CAD isn't Google. Finding an address is a challenge. Call handlers do not have access to the internet. They only have access to the data they receive from your phone and the database of addresses we have in the CAD system. The ISEC hit, as we've seen, might not be accurate enough to determine where they are. So, who do we ask for our location data? Predictably, these guys. The Ordnance Survey provide us with their address-based premium product for free, thanks to the Public Sector Geospatial Agreement. Thanks, Ordnance Survey. And this gives us a database of every address point in the country. Later, in the bar, we can have an argument about what qualifies as an address point. <laughs> so, we have every address in the UK in our database, and we can search it. And we know how to navigate the crew to that location, and then turn it into an address they can read. So, what's the address of the emergency? Uh-oh. Thing about Baker Street Station is no one knows where it is. I mean, people know where it is, it's there, um, but nobody knows its full address. According to TfL, it's not even on Baker Street. As you can see at the bottom, it's actually on Marlebone Road. How is a member of the public gonna have any chance of telling me the full address of a tube station when TfL doesn't even have the full postcode on the website? <laughs> 
We need to find Baker Street Station without putting in its full address. Now, CAD can match on a partial address string, but if I type in Baker Street, it's going to find the station and also every address along this road here. We need to find a way to talk specifically about the station. Also, on account of the tube being about 160 years old, um, depending on who you ask, there are four different ways you can refer to a tube station, all of which appear in the Ordnance Survey product. So, how did I solve this problem? Open data! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Turns out, if you ask them nicely, TFL will just tell you where all their stations are with coordinates. Brilliant. And what we then do internally once we've queried this API, I do this in slow time, this isn't happening live because the TFL API is disastrously slow, but it, it works, it does the job, and we then convert that into one internal canonical name for the station, U slash G, because it's fewer keystrokes than underground. So the call handler enters Baker Street U slash G into the CAD system and receives this full location match. Hooray! We do this sort of thing also for national rail stations, which we get directly from the DFT, uh, the Elizabeth Line, London Overground, the DLR, our own ambulance stations, because it would be exceptionally embarrassing if we couldn't find those, and um, <laughs> also these location signs that you see on the motorway, which we get in a not open data set from national highways. Time for another interesting tangent. You're at Baker Street Station in our scenario, but you're above ground, so someone's making the call on your behalf. What happens if you're deep in the bowels of the station with no mobile signal? The short answer is you find one of these people. Um, they will use a member, a member of staff can use a London Underground radio to contact their control room, who then let them know what's wrong, and they will then phone us to ask for the ambulance via the London Underground Control Centre. All these jobs you had no idea that existed, it's great. But the problem is directing us to the right place. If you're a caller on scene, I can ask you what you can see around you. If you're calling from the control room, you have to be able to identify which of the three entrances to Baker Street Station you need the ambulance to arrive at. Fortunately, TFL, being the clever so-and-sos they are, have given a numerical code for each entrance to each tube station or other stations that have interesting geography. Stratford is a great example. Um, we've also got codes for things like train depots, disused stations, tunnels, intervention points, places they might need us to go to that somebody on scene might not be able to describe accurately. Because districts aren't tremendously useful in London, uh, we blank out the district box in our data set, and handily that means that call handlers can pop one of those numeric codes in the district box to pull up the full location match. That's not a real one, I'm not allowed to show you a real one, but that's roughly how it works. Anyway, back to you and being dead. We've crossed another one off our to-do list. We've found your precise location thanks to the Ordnance Survey. You're in a tube station, which is unlucky for you in terms of being socially embarrassed, but is handy for us because it's easy to find. Now we need to send you an ambulance. Okay, it's finally time for me to address the 11 seconds thing. How do we do it that quickly, and why do I still have needing to send you an ambulance on the list? To answer this, I need to talk a little bit about triage. Remember these from earlier? A call handler doesn't just get to pick which of these to apply to a call. No, to ensure equity of care, these are set by NHS England based on the triage outcome of a call. Now it's time to talk about triage systems. Every ambulance service uses one of the two triage protocols, in England I should say, uses one of these two triage protocols approved for use in the country. The Medical Priority Dispatch System, or MPDS, um, or NHS Pathways. MPDS is used in over 40 countries all around the world and works absolutely identically at every service that operates it. NHS Pathways is, as the name would suggest, only used in the UK, and again, it works identically in every service that uses it, but also can be configured to work in urgent care as well as emergency care. That's how they triage calls at 111. This, in theory, provides equity of care. Everyone gets triaged according to the same sort of flowchart set of instructions, accounting for underlying medical conditions where it's relevant, and making sure that call handlers don't miss things or make mistakes. In London, we use MPDS, and fun fact, we are also the world's number one contributor of changes to the MPDS, thanks to our evidence-based clinical audit and research. Thank you. 
thank you. Shout out to our clinical research department. In the MPDS, every possible type of call is split up into one of 35 individual protocols which give the call handler the right set of questions and information about the condition. They account for, as I said, clinically relevant medical history, but also scene safety concerns for our responding crew if there's potentially something dangerous they'll encounter, and also mechanism of injury or illness. Based on the outcome of a protocol, a call, handler, a call sorry, is decide, assigned a triage determinant code, which summarises exactly what's wrong with the patient and how emergent their condition is. NHS Pathways works in a very similar way, but I haven't been on the course, so I can't show it to you. Regardless, no matter which of the two triage systems you end up being triaged under, the triage code determines exactly what's wrong with you. For you, currently in cardiac arrest, it will be one of these. I wish I had time to explain what they mean, but I don't, but you can ask me in the bar later. But for now, all you need to know is that they exist. So, whilst we may see this, our system sees this. Which is fine, because it doesn't need to know that you're in cardiac arrest. It doesn't need to make a medical decision. So you can just be a code. But because it sees you as a code, this happens. It's the job of an NHS England team called the Emergency Call Prioritisation Advisory Group, or ECPAG, because we love a snappy acronym, to assign in advance one of the five priorities to every single possible determinant code in both triage systems. In the MPDS alone, there are more than 1,800 of these codes, so as you can imagine, it takes some time. However, that's all been done, and then they provide us the list that we import into the lookup table in our CAD system. So now CAD knows your call is a category one, and it means that we know you're quite seriously sick. So it's at this point it can start doing stuff. See there where it says type code sets it on? This is a type code. Hold on a second. Automatic dispatch? Yeah. CAD knows where you are. And because it now knows that your call is a category one in this fetching purple color and has a determinant code that is eligible for automatic dispatch, it's going to start looking for available ambulances as soon as your call has a priority, which for category one, as we've discussed, happens pretty damn quickly. So as soon as it finds one, it's going to send the ambulance, even if the dispatcher, there it is, even if the dispatcher hasn't opened the call on their screen yet. So we can tick this item off, right? We've sent you an ambulance. Yeah, we have. But an emergency service on the scale of London can do better than just send you a couple of people in a big yellow van. The other benefit of this coding system is we can assign what is called a response matrix to the call, which sounds a lot fancier than it is, but means that if there's a type of call, such as a cardiac arrest, for which we wish to do something specific, we can configure the CAD to do that. For a cardiac arrest call, which you are currently experiencing, we send a double crewed ambulance. That's the standard big yellow thing with two people in it. But we will also send any one of these units. We can talk later about what they mean, but essentially they are solo paramedic responder vehicles that can get to you potentially quicker than an ambulance can because they're strategically dotted around London and provide you care on scene before taking you to hospital. We need to make sure that one person at least that we've sent to the call is a paramedic so that they can give you what my boss has asked me to stop calling the good drugs. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Um, and also, if we have one nearby, we will send a volunteer responder. They're in this blue because it's an optional check. It's not required for the call. But if we have an emergency responder, community first responder, someone trained in basic life support, we will send them if we can to get that CPR underway as quickly as possible. So that's one more thing to do. We figure out where you are and how to get you help. What are we going to do while you wait? It's not like on TV where they just give an address and hang up. Yeah, ambulance, uh, Bridge Street, Wolverine East. And you better make it quick. Call handler's least favourite thing to hear is you better make it quick. I'm also not sure how Phil Mitchell thought he was going to get an ambulance talking to his lock screen there. But <laughs> we digress. 
This is the MPDS instruction that is given by the call handler to the caller when we've completed triage. The call handler is going to talk whoever's called on your behalf through helping you. This can be all kinds of things from basic guidance about not having any food or drink in case you need surgery later to bleeding control or other first aid. However, for you, it's going to be CPR. How do you talk somebody through CPR over the phone if they've never done it before? I'm joking, I'm obviously joking. But having said that, the British Heart Foundation have produced a Spotify playlist of songs that are the right BPM to do CPR to. This is available now on Spotify if you Google BHF Life Saving Beats. When I learned it was Nelly the Elephant, but clearly times have moved on. Unfortunately, I can't actually show you the specifics of how we talk through someone through CPR because that's under copyright, licensed to my NHS trust, and basically I'm not allowed. However, what I can tell you is that we essentially give the caller a crash course, explaining just the key information, where they put their hands, how hard to press, that sort of thing, and we count them through each compression metronome style. We can give instructions for all kinds of first aid, as I said, like bleeding control, using a defibrillator, um, helping someone who's having a seizure, like Cameron mentioned, use of drugs like an EpiPen or naloxone for an overdose, or even delivering a baby all over the phone. I personally have delivered five babies over the phone. Thank you very much. This, this is the badge that the Clinical Audit and Research Unit give you if you deliver a baby over the phone. It's a little stalk. That lives on my work lanyard. <laughs> it's, it is a point of pride. They are tremendously fulfilling. So, that's it, really. We've completed our list, and we've got an ambulance sent to you, and we're helping you while you wait. But in the words of so many Apple keynotes, one more thing. Remember earlier when we were talking about the BHF? I wasn't putting that Chekhov's gun on the screen without intending to fire it later. Did you know they have a national database of all the public access defibrillators in the country? These are the ones around here that they know about, but they have this nationally. So, and also, this is, this is a screenshot from defibfinder.uk. I don't know if you can see in the corner. You can just punch in an address and find out where they are. But this also has an API. And as you know by now, I love an API. So, because your call's been coded as one of these, CAD knows you're in cardiac arrest, and a defibrillator might be of benefit, so we will send one. The BHF give us a data dump from their database called the circuit of all the public access defibrillators and the access codes if they're in a locked box, because you'll have seen them with the pin codes that say call 999 for the code. That's how it works. We get that information from the BHF uh, in order to try and make you less dead. We also have our own internal database of defibrillators because our first responders team distribute them to public places, for example, every tube station. And in those cases, because we know who's in charge of the defib, we can send an automated call or text if it's needed, asking whoever's like the security desk, that kind of thing, to take it to the patient. So now that really is it. We've completed our checklist and we've even sent you a defib for good measure. The person that called the ambulance for you is now cracking on with CPR, and because you've received early CPR and early defibrillation, you now have a remarkable up to 70% chance of surviving your cardiac arrest. <laughs> Shall we do one more of these for good measure, and then I have to go. Time for the last of my interesting tangents. What about when it all goes wrong? Plenty of you in this audience will have all too intimate experience with IT systems that have proven to be less resilient than you'd hoped. But we don't have the option for that. Working at this organisation is the first time I have ever seen a 100% uptime service level agreement. So it's a fact of life that outages happen. How do we cope? Starting with telephony, our entire telephony system is replicated as a hot standby. 
from the direct dials that BT used to put the 999 calls through to us, through to the skills-based routing configuration that gets the call to the call handler, and down even to the actual physical telephone on the call handler's desk. In the back end, we have two fully redundant and geographically separate ISDN trunks, and if those fail, we also have two independent SIP trunks, each with different providers, so that they can still deliver 999 calls to the control room. And come the PSTN switch off in 2025, they can prize the ISDN kit out of my cold dead hands. And given that we don't have the option to shut up shop when the system fails, we have to be able to operate the entire system using pen and paper. In times of no computerized technology, we can do it all by hand. We have a paper flip file version of the triage system and call handlers can write down the address, finding it in a map book. They do still make them. And if a call taken in North London needs to be dispatched in South London, we use one of these. For the young people in the audience, this is a fax machine. Please ask QTEL how it works. <laughs> and the last thing before I go, the calls that are in CAD at the time of the crash still need to be dispatched on, so a piece of software written by yours truly copies them onto redundant workstations in each of our two control rooms so that in the event of a system failure we can then print them out onto those pink slips you saw a moment ago. So tangents all done, that's the end of the story. We found you using open data aided by the live geospatial information from your phone, used the world's most popular structured emergency medical triage system to figure out exactly what was wrong with you and got you the best possible response based on exactly what had happened. And everybody lived happily ever after. Well, not you. You spent a month in hospital having heart surgery, but you didn't die. And that is how to save a life. Thank you very much. There is so much more I wish I'd had time to talk about, but 30 minutes absolutely flies by. I'm going to be in the Q&A tent. Maybe there'll be a part two in 2026. Who knows? Uh, but do ask me questions if you have them. I'll answer them if I'm, if I'm allowed to. But that's, that's all from me, and happy EMF. Thank you very much.